Okay, Chica Loca still. I think that entrepreneurs see pain points and then have to solve them. I always tell people, don't focus on the PowerPoints, focus on the pain points. And for me, the pain point, even before I stepped into that taxi in Buenos Aires that you mentioned with a driver with an engineering degree, I had been living in Buenos Aires and got very frustrated and confused by the fact that all the young people wanted government jobs. Here's a guy with an engineering degree driving a taxi. I had to ask what I thought was the obvious question. Excuse me, sir, you know, why aren't you starting a business? And he kept using the word empresario. And I knew that people felt big business leaders had an in with the government, had a Swiss bank account, were really not about job creation, were really about just sort of taking for themselves. And I kept saying, no, 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 no es empresario, es otra palabra. You know, it's another word, what's the word? And we went back and forth and the driver says to me, I don't think there is a word for what you're talking about. I was talking about innovation and entrepreneurship and startup. And I was like, no wonder no one's becoming an entrepreneur. They don't even have a word. So that really was the impetus. And no one at the time, now it was 1997 when my co-founder and I founded Endeavor, everyone thought this was a terrible idea, that we would never find entrepreneurs in emerging market. We wanted the high impact ones that would really grow and create the jobs and the innovation be the role models. People said, absolutely not. And I was known as La Chica Loca, the crazy girl. Uh, for going around believing this. But my favorite moment at Endeavor came six or seven years later when the editor of the Brazilian Portuguese Dictionary called up our team in Brazil and said in part, because of Endeavor's work, they were going to add the words empreendedor and empreendedorismo into the dictionary. So that, that's pretty good. But to just end this, it's very funny how things change. So now it's almost 20 years later. And when I tell this story, People say, oh, the gringa, she doesn't even know there's a word emprendedor in Spanish. And I think, how, how nice that things can change. I grew up in a traditional family outside of Boston. My parents met as high school sweethearts. My dad is a lawyer. My mom stayed home to raise three kids. And I was expected to take the traditional path. And I went to Harvard for college and Yale for law school, get there and realize I have no interest in practicing law. So I ended up getting an opportunity to go to Latin America, as we described when the taxi happened. And I came back and my parents assumed I was now going to get a real job after my you know, time off. And when my co-founder Peter and I were writing Endeavor's business plan, literally on a napkin, how cliche can you get, but we were in my parents' kitchen writing a napkin, my parents got very nervous. <laughs> and they said, well, wait a minute. Maybe it's not the law, but aren't you going to get a job in consulting? It was really scary for me to tell them I was going to do something that was unknown, unproven, may likely fail. And what I've come to believe working with entrepreneurs in now 25 different countries is that the biggest barrier to entrepreneurship, to getting going, they're not structural, they're not financial, they're not even cultural, they're psychological. And so I think that that moment of, I call it my kitchen table moment, when I had to tell my parents, no, I'm doing something that's not safe, but I have to do it. I think that I've spent the last decades helping others in that scary moment realize that they can move forward. And even if people call them crazy, then that's okay. I say, take it as a compliment. Entrepreneurship is hard. Entrepreneurship is supposed to be hard because if you're a pioneer, then it's going to be harder. It means other people would have done your idea before you. So I always tell people, on the one hand, you have to give yourself permission to move forward with something you're really passionate about. But on the other hand, you have to be prepared that it's going to be difficult. And if you're not, if you think this is just easy, then maybe this isn't the right thing for you. Endeavor defines high impact as the entrepreneurs with the biggest dreams, but like you said, they have to be doers as well. And we're not looking at startups, we're looking at scale-ups. So we're looking at entrepreneurs in every industry. So many are in technology, but many are also in consumer goods or manufacturing or health or education. But they have to have ideas that have gotten off the ground, that basically have anywhere from a half a million in revenues to 20 million in revenues, but that could, with a push, really scale, really go big, um, many of them go international, 
And then these entrepreneurs become the role models so that young people can say, if he can do it, if she can do it, I can too. And now we've actually mapped out in each ecosystem we're in a multiplier effect that happens, where if you have a few entrepreneurs that make it big and then give it back into the ecosystem by not only being the role models, but actively mentoring, actively angel investing, that that's actually how entrepreneurial ecosystems are built. So we want people to actually have their bubbles on this map. We show the influence by bubbles. We, we're, we're the only one who likes bubbles. We want people's bubbles to go bigger and, and, and give back into the system. So we're betting on people who are not only gonna do well by their own company and their own employees, but whose success will then feed to make sure others can dream big as well. You know, when it ever started, very few people, as I said, were looking at entrepreneurship at all. And that's changed, but I found that entrepreneurship has only become associated with startups and only become associated with Silicon Valley, or mainly. And so I'm always telling people, you don't need to be a boy in a hoodie living in Silicon Valley to be an entrepreneur. And I think that one of the things Endeavor has done is said, you can be an entrepreneur in any industry. You can be an entrepreneur at any age, male, female, any background, doesn't matter what your last name is, doesn't matter what you know, university you went to. If you're someone who is able to follow through and execute on that idea and convince others, then there's a, a group of people that will support you to dream even bigger. And that scale up moment is, I find, the critical one where companies either go out of business. Most companies start up and then go out of business within 24 months. But if you can find a way to unlock the growth potential, that's where the sustainable job and wealth creation comes. So that's the moment that Endeavor focuses on and I think gives people hope. I have changed my mind. I used to very confidently say, oh, you, have, you can't teach entrepreneurship, you have to be born. <laughs> Look, I do think to be a high impact entrepreneur, what we're calling, I mean, people who grow businesses to a very big level and have to hire and often fire people, that takes a certain stomach <laughs> and a certain tolerance for chaos and risk that I'm not sure everyone has. But I wrote a book, Crazy is a Compliment, because I've come to believe that we all need to think and act like entrepreneurs today. And whether it's people that are worried about losing their jobs, or worried about getting ahead in a big corporation, or people that are starting something in their basement or in their kitchen, or people who are starting a nonprofit, or people who want to think of something big. I think today, if we don't take some risk, we risk being left behind. If we don't think like entrepreneurs, then we're, then we're assuming that these big institutions are gonna solve our problems. And I think we have to write our own stories and, and be masters of our own destinies, and that's what entrepreneurs do best. Everyone can learn to think and act like an entrepreneur. Well, we have a number of stories of tech companies that have gone from, you know, uh, startups, if not in the garage, then in cafes and gone on to become public companies. One of my favorite stories, because it's less expected, is the story of Leila Velez in um, Brazil. We met when she and her sister-in-law Zika were starting a hair care products company for the Afro-Brazilian population and people generally with curly hair. I can relate. <laughs> And it started because Layla had grown up in the slums of Rio, in the favelas. Her mother was a maid, her father was a janitor, and she got a job at 15 working at McDonald's as a cashier. And she said, oh, this franchise thing is pretty good, but I want to use it to help poor people feel beautiful. And they don't because they don't have products that work for them. And so she convinced her sister-in-law Zika to start something. They started like a mad scientist lab in their, in their kitchen. They created their first product, tested it on their husbands. The husband's hair fell out. <laughs> they went back to the sink and we met them when they had one salon in Rio, but that salon had six hour waits. And they were really thinking big and we decided to take a bet on them. So Endeavor helped um, bring professional management. Layla became officially CEO. Zika was the face of the brand. We sent Layla to Harvard Business School for, uh, for training. When 
They, when Layla divorced her husband, we helped write a shareholder agreement with now her ex-sister-in-law. That's, I often say Endeavor 101 is how to fire your mother-in-law and still, and still shove to family dinner. Uh, we then actually helped Layla find her second husband. Endeavor is a full service organization. Um, but when I tell this story, people assume I'm talking about women in microfinance. What a nice story. Oh, now do they have two salons? I said, no, 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 my friends. <laughs> There's nothing micro about Layla and the Les Natural. So it's stories like that that inspire me. People always ask me how I initially got anyone to support us. And I always say, by stalking. <laughs> I always say, stalking is an underrated startup strategy. So, you know, at first, my co-founder Peter and I were kind of uh, all alone when no one, no one thought we were, you know, onto anything. And um, I ended up getting a meeting uh, early on in 1998 with a, a guy named Eduardo Elstein, who had become famous in Argentina for, at that point, making George Soros the largest landowner in the country. And I got a 10 minute meeting, five minutes in the meeting. Eduardo looks at his watch and says, okay, Linda, I know you want a meeting with George Soros. I'll see what I can do. And I said, no, Eduardo, I'm an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur. This is an organization about entrepreneurs. I want your time, your passion, and $200,000. So he turns to his right hand guy and says, esta chica esta loca. And I looked at him and said, Eduardo, estoy decepcionada. I'm disappointed. This from the man who walked into Soros's office and famously came out with a $10 million check. You're lucky I only asked you for 200,000. He turned away. I thought he was going to kick me out of the room. Turned away, turned down, took out his checkbook and wrote me a check on the spot for $200,000 and became the first chairman of Endeavor Argentina. And what I learned from that is a couple things. First of all, I got my mantra, crazy is a compliment. I, am, I embraced being chica loca. But I also realized the importance of having local business leaders pull Endeavor in. So while I've had many supporters here in the United States from people like Edgar Bronfman Jr., my chairman, Piero Midjar and his group from eBay, Reid Hoffman of LinkedIn is on my board, so many. I think what's really made Endeavor special is that we won't go into a country unless we're pulled in by the local business leaders who take ownership, who become partners. So an Endeavor now has a team of 400 full-time people. Most are based outside the United States. We have boards in every country. And I think that that's been super important um, because if, if you don't have the local network that's mentoring the next group of people coming up, it's very hard. When I go back and take out that napkin that Peter and I uh, created, two things strike me. Number one is how many things have stayed the same? You know, we believed that you would select the right entrepreneurs, you would give them a mentorship, which was lacking, you would help them access capital, you would tell their success stories, you would encourage them to give back, and then the circle would continue. No one thought any of this would happen. They never thought we'd find the entrepreneurs, they never thought we'd, they'd get, then get capital, they never thought they'd grow and exit, and then they certainly never thought they'd give back. And so all of that has stayed true, but here's a couple things that have changed. Um, I was outvoted, I thought we would never go outside the emerging markets, and then first we got phone calls from Greece saying, after the crisis, we, we need your help. And I started joking that, okay, well, we can go to these submerging markets. <laughs> but um, no, but I kept saying, look, when economies turn down, that's when entrepreneurs turn up and that's when Endeavor should be there. And after Greece came on board and it's been a, a great success, Spain came on board. Endeavor was known as venture capital without the capital. And we said we, we, we never wanted to um, create a misalignment with our entrepreneurs. But the world has changed and so many people started investing we said, let's give our entrepreneurs an extra hug. Let's, anytime any investor comes in, uh, we'll take 10% of the round, but we won't get involved in negotiations. We won't take a board seat. And instead of uh, creating a barrier between our entrepreneurs, it's actually drawn them closer. And in fact, we've been able to encourage investors to do bigger rounds. So this growth capital that didn't really exist of five to $10 million rounds, Endeavor's been able to encourage. Those were two ideas I never saw coming. And so what I've learned is that you have to, on the one hand, if you're an entrepreneur, stay true to your original ideals, but then be open to the world changing and not be so stubborn as I was initially to, to not evolve. It's funny, I don't mind the ones that fail quickly. Well, 
okay, that was a big idea, that's okay. And I don't even mind the ones where we made a mistake. There are some people who didn't want to grow. They should have been a lifestyle business and we pushed them to grow and they wanted it to be a lifestyle business. That was our fault. What disappoints me is that the people who, we all cause our own problems most of the time, it's not the market, but who don't learn from that and repeat the mistakes and get so tunnel visioned and so blindsided and don't look at our own failings and don't let go don't build a team around them that's complementary to who they are. Try to just be Steve Jobs when they're not Steve Jobs. That's why I've created a test and an entrepreneur personality test that people can go take because I feel like everyone doesn't model themselves after one or two entrepreneurs. They have to find what's my personality and then how do I build a team around me that complements it. So I get most disappointed by the people who don't grow because they couldn't get out of their own head. I think that sometimes the we're saving the world mentality can be just as arrogant and blindsided as the I want to get rich mentality. I think that the best entrepreneurs solve problems. And so it's not so much that they see themselves as God's gift to uh, saving the world, it's that they're doers. One of the mistakes we make um, in terms of envisioning entrepreneurs is we see them as these huge risk takers right, who are tilting at windmills and ch you know, changing the world. And the best entrepreneurs I've seen are risk minimizers. They're not risk maximizers. They're people who just see the world differently and act on what they see, but they do it in a very tactical, pragmatic way. So I think that the best entrepreneurs actually aren't necessarily missionaries. They're much more pragmatic than that. They just see a problem that they can't stop unless they solve it. Here's the interesting thing. So Endeavor has helped our entrepreneurs raise a couple billion dollars in capital, not a small amount. Every time we do a survey asking our entrepreneurs what was most important, capital comes towards the bottom of the list. Having a network that believes in me, number one. Gaining access to mentors who've done it before and can help me avoid pitfalls and mistakes, number two. The only thing lower than capital is, you know, changing regulatory issues because I, I get annoyed when the World Bank says the biggest problem is how many days it takes to start a business. Like that is going to deter an entrepreneur. No, my friends. <laughs> but if you don't, if, you, if you're the crazy person and, and you're going to get, you know, divorced from your family and community if you fail, the, the lack of appreciation for failure being part of the entrepreneurial journey is I think what people need to change and having a support network that says, we're gonna help you think big, but then if it doesn't work out, we're gonna support your next venture, gives them the courage to move forward. And I, I think that that's underrated, I do. Some of our best companies are people who come through, we start our selection process, takes almost a year. You go through a local selection process and then have to go to a global panel. And so it's very challenging, but you get these wonderful debates. And one of our best companies were these four techies from Argentina. And they had started a company to outsource, um, not uh, like what you do in India, the back end, but high technologies. Great, great company, rejected from our first selection panel. Why? They were too arrogant. Back to what we said. People said they'll never take advice, they'll never listen. They spent a year determined to come back and be Endeavor entrepreneurs. Instead of saying, we're not gonna let you, they failed very publicly. They came back, they both now sit on the board of Endeavor Argentina, and I love that they now publicly go to Morocco and Indonesia tell it in South Africa, telling their story of failure within the Endeavor network to encourage people that even if they don't make it the first time to come back. So we've actually created within our own process this notion of it's okay. Move on to the next thing. Well, wait a minute. We have all of these investors coming. Why doesn't Endeavor have any skin in the game? It would be an extra seal of approval. And we spent three years debating how we could do it in a rules-based way. We didn't want to pick and choose among our children. <laughs> so we created um, uh, members of my board who are venture capitalists. Um, joined a committee to help us create a series of rules. So now anytime any Endeavor entrepreneur raises a round of capital at $5 million or above, Endeavor comes in at up to $1 million of the investment. And then I want to be one of the few nonprofits 
that is completely self-sustained based on the success of the very people we support. I think that would be a great, great statement. One of the things that allowed me to be a little bit crazy is that I, I did, I had a very stable home life. So that's what I'm trying to provide for my children. So I literally traveled to Dubai for a day so I can come back and pick them up at school. That's what benefited me. Maybe other people, uh, it's the instability that makes them think bigger. But for me, I sort of said, okay, I had my suburban upbringing and I, I, and I just wanted to see the world. That's why I left for Latin America. Now I travel all over. It's, it's exciting, but yet I have roots to come back to. I live in Brooklyn. And anytime when I'm not doing these one day trips around the world, I'm back in Brooklyn. So that's what works for me. I had the impression that to be a female CEO, I had to be not necessarily tough. I'm not, I smile too much to be tough, but really independent, not bring in any personal life and kind of create that wall because you had to be strong. And that's how I led. And then I was put on bed rest when I was pregnant with these identical twins. And then I, um, my husband, who's a journalist, he was diagnosed with a rare form of bone cancer. I decided, this is right when we had been given this expansion mandate, 25 countries by 2015, we were in 10, and I called up our board and I said, I don't know if I can do this. I'm not getting on a plane. I am going to every chemotherapy session, and when I'm not doing that, my girls were then three. I said, I've got to bring them stability. That's what's important. And didn't surprise me is that we expanded more that year than we had it before and that the team and the board and the network stepped up. But here's what changed after. So I started talking much more openly about my personal life, which I'd never done. And I always thought that would distance people from me. And instead it drew them closer. And two young um, employees came up and they said, Linda, we always admired you, but you seemed superhuman. And I realized, not in a good way, in a, an, an unapproachable way. And they said, now that we see your vulnerabilities, now we'll follow you anywhere. And so I said, ah, oh, I've been spending all this time trying to be superhuman, when really I had to be less super and more human. And I tell people, I hope you don't have to go through the experience I did to get to that same conclusion. So that's what I've learned. You know, my goal is that every young person, or every old person too, in fact, the, the biggest number of people starting businesses in this country, in the US, are baby boomers over 65. Who knew? We don't tell their stories. I want that everyone who has a dream but is scared can give themselves permission to try because they've looked at someone and said, if he can do it, if she can do it, I can too. So I think that if we can help people overcome their own fears and get out of their own heads and take chances with their own dreams, I, I do think things will be better. Call me crazy. <laughs>